I guess a lot of people would say rock and roll is, amongst many things, uh, primarily a kind of attitude. I think you see that Lou Reed's music has a lot of attitude. Heroin were, uh, words. <laughs> music and lyrics, Lou Reed. You know, it's a music of confrontation. It's supposed to be, at least in the old times, the kind of music your parents wouldn't like. It's specifically rebellious in the way that, for instance, hip hop might be today. Are you happier as a schmuck? So Lou has this very long and complicated career that starts with the Velvets. We're sponsoring a new band. It's called the Velvet Underground. Andy's original vision for the Velvet Underground was that they would be the house band for the factory. The story actually starts before then. Lou Reed was part of a songwriting studio where they would listen to sort of the hits of the day and then come in and to their resident composers and say, oh, uh, the Ventures have a big hit. We need 10 songs that sound like surf music. So that's what he was, he was kind of a house composer, if you will. And this is where he met John Cale. They got um, Mo Tucker to sit in, and she was supposed to just be like a last minute replacement, but they liked how the show went so, so much that they just invited her to be part of the band. Good evening. We're your local Velvet Underground. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm scared 24 hours a day, but not necessarily in New York. As you know, Andy produced the first record. Uh, I should say produced in air quotes because he didn't really do that much. Other than insist that Nico join the band. It's not a thing that Lou was too happy about, but he was professional about it. Nico sang some of the songs, Lou sang some of the songs, but that was just for the first record and Lou decided enough of that. Got rid of Andy and Nico, but remained lifelong friends with both of them and he considered Andy to be one of his really big guiding lights in art. And they remained friends to the very end. What do you think about him now? Are you still friends with him? Oh yeah. Has he been very important in your life? Do you make a big difference to you? Oh, he was everything. Still is. So we have a bunch of Andy Warhol related materials on this wall. This is Andy's philosophical home, if you will, from A to B and back again. This was given to Lou Reed and Lou was very inspired by this and began to write a bunch of songs. So one of the things that we have in the collection are lots of demo tapes and unreleased materials. So here are a bunch of demo songs, forced unreleased songs that relate to this book. So Lou read the book and was inspired by the book and started working on songs. This is the actual tape that he recorded on. And of course, also related to Andy Warhol is the big reunion with John Cale in 1990, the Songs for Drella album. These are two songs written by Lou and I from a tribute to Andy Warhol, Songs for Drella. It's been commissioned by the Brooklyn Academy of Music for the next Wave Festival in Amanda later this year. Drella, as you might know, is short for Dracula and Cinderella. That was their nickname for Andy because they thought, well, Andy was a, exactly a 50-50 mix of Dracula and Cinderella. He personally hated this nickname, but it was meant in jest and with affection. When Andy Warhol died, there was all this stuff in the news. John Cale and Lou Reed felt like people were obsessed with the more sort of fantastic and salacious aspects of Andy's life. But Andy to them was a mentor and a friend and a really good person. So they wanted to make an album about how wonderful Andy Warhol was. Who has this very long and complicated career that starts kind of with the Velvets and then a long, long solo career. True poets must often stand alone. As a poet, he must be counted as a solitary artist. When Lou Reed left the Velvet Underground, he went back to his parents' place in Long Island with the idea that he would just uh, work for his dad and write poetry. Uh, and so this room is kind of devoted to, specifically to Lou's literary aspirations. Such a perfect day. You made me forget myself I thought I was somebody else Someone good, 
So Havel said, well, if Lou Reed isn't invited, I'm not coming. And so they buckled. And you can see here, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, uh, everyone dressed in their Sunday best, and Lou has his very best black t-shirt on. <laughs> Thank you for brutally and benevolently injecting your poetry into music. And for this, we welcome you, Lou Reed, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This is perhaps my absolute favorite part of the exhibit. When we took in the Lou Reed archive, there were lots and lots of audio tapes and videotapes and things that were unexplained. One of which was this. We found a bunch of these videotapes that just sort of flicker and roll in this way. And we weren't sure what they were. In fact, even when we digitized them, the person who accepted the tapes to do the work said, I think these tapes are broken. Then we found this and we understood what these tapes were. Uh, in the mid-70s, when Lou Reed went on tour, he toured with a whole bunch of televisions as the backdrop. It was a big problem because if you, if you play music, you know that television signals and cathode ray tubes and electric guitars and amplifiers do not get along well because they produce a lot of radio frequencies and stuff. So the band was also not so happy to be standing in front of these TVs and playing and the noise was feeding into their amplifiers. And I guess what he was trying to replicate here was kind of audio feedback translated into the video realm. So he sat and he recorded things on TV with his video camera, then played them back through the TV and re-recorded them over and over again to make these sort of flickering videotapes. So the other thing we found in Lou Reed's archive were all of these This one's the most interesting though. It's from The Pleasure Chest, 7th Avenue, New York City, which still exists today. This is a sex shop. And what Lou Reed did was he went and bought all of the collars and cuffs that he used for the rock and roll animal artwork. We know that the artwork and the original photography was done the day after this receipt was dated. So clearly what happened was Lou Reed, knowing this photo shoot was coming, went to the pleasure chest, bought a bunch of gear, and then used it in this famous photo shoot. This is one of the more notorious items in the collection. Uh, this tape was found sealed amongst Lou Reed's compact discs. We weren't sure what it was because it was sealed. And now we sort of know what the story is. This is a demo in 1965 of Lou Reed. John Cale is also on it. He sings harmony, uh, singing all these songs. And if you listen to the tape, you hear him say, Pale blue eyes, words, music, Lou Reed words and music by Lou Reed, and then he plays the song all the way through. And so what this was, was him documenting the authorship of all of these songs. And in the old days, it was thought that if you had a tape, the tape was sealed and notarized and sent through the US mail, that it was functioned as a kind of poor man's copyright. But what's interesting about this is this is 1965, which is a year, not quite a full year, before the first Velvet Underground album. And all these songs, of course, appear on, appear on the first Velvet Underground album, and they're totally different. So these are all kind of sung in a country blues or kind of folk style with acoustic guitar, vocal harmony. Linger on your pale blue eyes. Linger on. And then, of course, they all appear in 66. They get recorded as part of the first album. And of course, they're very, very noisy and electric and alive and very different. So sometime during that year, uh, his vision of how these songs should be played changed, which probably had something to do with John Cale and Lamont Young and all of the other artistic activities that were going on at the time. 